Hi, I'm Rob Downey. I'm a family practice MD. I'm also a certified practitioner via the Institute for Functional Medicine. And here at South Peninsula Hospital Functional Medicine, we offer functional medicine as a specialty-like approach, and we coordinate with the patient's primary care provider. Functional medicine started as a conversation in Washington and Oregon between David Jones, a family practice doctor, and Jeff Bland, a physiologist who had worked with Linus Pauling. And this conversation was 30 years ago. It was a conversation prompted by David Jones saying, I'm a family practice doctor. I, I see these patients who are tired and they're, they're not depressed. They don't have anemia. They don't have cancer. I know from my medical school training that B vitamins could help the power plants of their cells. But how do I translate that to what would be a safe way to use B vitamins for these people or should I be thinking of something else? So David Jones and Jeff Bland said, okay, let's think this through. What if we built the healthcare system from the ground up based on principles that are already out there in New England Journal, JAMA, Lancet, et cetera, but we included a bigger toolbox, a bigger set of principles that can answer these, these questions. And now 30 years later, there's a textbook of functional medicine, there's a certification program. There are amazing things happening around the country and around the world, including here in Homer. Functional medicine is a reconceptualization of health or the lack of health. So here's the functional medicine toolbox. You can see at the top all of the things that an MD or other doctor or other medical provider uses are still in play. So for me, if I see somebody who is tired, I am going to start by making sure that they don't have cancer or they don't have anemia or they're not depressed. The larger part of the toolbox and sometimes the most powerful part of the toolbox, looking at food as medicine, using stress management, looking at how the person sleeps, making sure that social support is present or if it's not, that it's added, exercise, appropriate professional grade supplements, and functional medicine testing. Before we look under the hood, which is one of my big goals today is for you to get a chance to look under the hood and kind of see how functional medicine works, I want you to hear what's happening with functional medicine around the country. I think it'll give you a sense of what's possible and then when we do look under the hood it'll, it'll be more interesting knowing kind of how this works. So this is Terry Walls. She's a really interesting lady. She's an MD at the University of Iowa. And you can see on the left, that's Terry Walls in 2008. And to the right, that's Terry Walls, 2009-ish onward. So on the left, Terry is wheelchair bound. She has progressive multiple sclerosis. This is a neurodegenerative condition, meaning her nervous system sort of wears out and shuts down. It has what's called an autoimmune component where the immune system attacks the self. It's a terrible condition. It's difficult to fight. And Dr. Walls didn't set out to use functional medicine. She simply wanted her multiple sclerosis to get better. So she used all the medications that were available. She did physical therapy. She did neurologic stimulation. And nonetheless, in 2008, she was in a wheelchair. So she simply pursued what's out there that can help multiple sclerosis. And what she found was a, a program that she could purchase from the Institute for Functional Medicine to learn about vitamins and minerals and supplements and food and various things that were non-drug approaches that could help. And when Dr. Walls did that, her multiple sclerosis stopped progressing. So this was a pivotal moment for her. And then she kept reading and she kept learning and she found out that, that plant foods are healing. So she added those to her supplements and her other practices. And in Dr. Wall's own words, that's when the magic happened. Then her multiple sclerosis started going backwards. It started to go away. So, Dr. Walls is also on the Institutional Review Board at her institution there, which is the group that determines what sorts of studies can be done. 
And when Dr. Walls showed up at these subsequent meetings, not in her wheelchair anymore, they said, gosh, Terry, this is amazing. What did you do? And she said, oh, I did functional medicine and I'd like to do a study and see if we can get improvement in other individuals. And they said, all right, we'll allow you to do a study with people that do exactly what you did. That's what we'll give you permission to do. In a minute, I'll show you her study and, and her approach. Also, it's interesting to know that Dr. Walls takes care of veterans and she has a VA clinic for multiple sclerosis in the Midwest that now has moved many, many individuals forward with her approach. So as I noted, Dr. Walls has had the progressive MS. It's been in remission since 2008, many years now. She's also the author of the Walls Protocol that describes her approach for in lay terms so that it's accessible to everybody. And she obtained this IRB approved clinical trial that demonstrated reproducible benefit in others, which is very significant. Dr. Walls thought that due to the small number of subjects in the study, she might have trouble generating what's called statistical power, whether or not the study would be significant. And the fact that these individuals improved so much is what generated the statistical power and what made her so pleased and them, of course, so pleased with the outcome. So here's Dr. Wall's study and I'll show you on the next slide. The top is the improvement in things like energy or general health, big shift for the better in her subjects. The bottom are the signs and symptoms that burden people with MS and you can see that those dropped significantly. Her study was published in 2015. Now here's what's different about Dr. Wall's approach in that this isn't a drug, this isn't a silver bullet, this is a number of things that she did. So in her study she needed to do a number of things for these individuals. So she had them on this modified paleo diet, she had a home exercise program with what's called neuromuscular stim stimulation, there's electrodes helping the muscles sort of come back online, vitamins and nutritional supplements and stress management. You can see her approach is a lot of vegetables, animal protein, omega-3 fatty acid. Also, Dr. Walls had those individuals and herself stay away from gluten, dairy, and eggs because they're immune disruptors in a lot of folks and because multiple sclerosis has this immune system attacking the self component, it was important to keep any immune disruptors out of the food. And here's the nine cups of vegetables and fruit that Dr. Walls has every day and that the veterans have every day in her program, which is sort of a miracle in itself. And when I met Dr. Walls a couple of years ago in Chicago, she was undergoing certification as a functional medicine practitioner, even though she was already on faculty, so maybe it was kind of housekeeping or a nice thing for her to do to get certified. I'd already heard about her book and thought she was a hero and I told her as much, asked her if she had any observations and she said, I cannot overstate the importance of 9 to 11 servings of vegetables every day. So that has really stayed with me. Next we should talk about Dale Bredesen. He is an MD neurologist in California and a researcher. He has devoted the last 25 years of his life to understanding Alzheimer's. And like Dr. Walls, he has taken a condition that prior to now doesn't reverse via almost any measure. And he is getting reversal in people that he takes care of and in people that he trains. Their dementia is going backwards. So he uses this functional medicine approach to Alzheimer's, multimodal again, not one silver bullet, what Dr. Bredesen would call silver buckshot. And his trial participants had either frank Alzheimer's disease in its early stage or the precursors to Alzheimer's disease, amnestic mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive impairment. Out of these 10 patients, again, a relatively small group, they had terrific shifts. So he had statistical power in this study and 90% of these individuals using his program which is called Recode improved and stayed better. 
here's his study if you'd like to learn more about it. Also worth noting that this journal, Aging, told Dr. Bredesen later that the number of inquiries generated by this article about these 10 patients was in the 99.99th percentile of people calling the journal, contacting the journal, emailing, and saying, we've got to know more about this. What is going on? So this is a really neat thing that's happening. This is the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine that started in 2014. And what's great about bringing Cleveland Clinic into the equation is the, the magnitude of Cleveland Clinic prior to their connection with functional medicine. They were already recognized as one of the 100 best hospitals in the world, a national leader up there with, with the very best. And when they added functional medicine, they started collecting data called PROMIS data, P-R-O-M-I-S, all in caps, generated by the National Institutes of Health. Well, why does this matter? It matters because PROMIS data lets you measure outcomes across settings meaning you can use this NIH tool and say, well, what's an outcome like in this setting? It's an apple. Over here, this is an orange. What's that outcome like? And if you measure it with the PROMIS tool, you can say, how good is the outcome? How much did it cost? And how happy is the patient? Now, as the folks that are trying to look at where healthcare is going 2017 onward ask, how is the system going to work better? How are people going to be healthier? How are going to control cost? How are people going to be pleased? This is called the triple aim and it's the holy grail for healthcare administrators, leaders in the political realm, people that care about the future of healthcare. This triple aim data coming out of Cleveland Clinic is showing around 20% reduction in cost, 20% better outcomes with happier patients. This is for the treatment of asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, type 2 diabetes. The most recent version of this data that I saw prior to putting together this slide this came from about 4,000 patients seeing the functional medicine providers at Cleveland Clinic for a host of reasons. This is the beginning of a really important trend and this type of data understates or underestimates the difference to somebody who saves their bowel from ulcerative colitis rather than having it removed. That's not a 20% improvement. That's a black and white change in their life forever. One other person I think we should talk about before we segue into how functional medicine works, this is Robert Darling. He's an MD. He's a little bit like Dr. Walls in my mind in that he's not the sort of person you would predict would go into complementary or alternative medicine, which actually isn't what functional medicine is. It's its own critter, but it's understandable why people would think it's complementary or alternative, and Dr. Darling is a career Navy physician, an internist in the Navy. From 1996 to 1999, Dr. Darling was the physician to the president, President Clinton at that time. That set the stage for him to continue on and be a concierge doctor for CEOs and other C-suite type people all over the world. So Dr. Darling was in a position to be able to kind of do anything. And he said, what I want to do is functional medicine. I want to go back to school. I want to get certified in this. Why? Because it's revolutionary. Because it looks at things through a different lens. And Dr. Darling is particularly interested in this aspect, which allows reversal of chronic disease. Also, he's very moved by the fact that this is a way to revolutionize wellness for employee wellness, staying ahead of things, preventing things before they happen. And he's part of a company called Lead Health that remotely provides employee wellness as a business via the functional medicine model, they're also seeing those PROMISE scores show very impressive findings. And they're seeing that employees who have autoimmune diseases in particular do spectacularly well. And about six of the top 10 things that burden companies are autoimmune. So functional medicine is well positioned to help with that. You've had a chance to hear about these people, these cases. I imagine at this point you're thinking, all right, how does this work? So, Here's a way to think about it. The fox knows many little things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. So the hedgehog's kind of like conventional medicine. 
we find the broken bone and we come up with the perfect solution. We pick one antibiotic to kill that type of pneumonia. We pick the right surgery for that sort of brain tumor. It's a sort of one-to-one -one connection between the diagnosis and the treatment. And it's terrific for acute issues, for acute problem solving. The FOX doesn't have one strategy. It has many, many strategies. And these are both successful critters. Functional medicine is more like the FOX, and there are certain types of problems that respond better to an approach that uses many little things, not one big thing. The actual source of the quote is Henry Rutter in this Lancet article from 2011. And Harry Rutter was talking about what we need to move the needle with, with obesity. And he was pointing to this issue. He was saying, we need systems biology. We need to understand the interrelationship of all these different components that contribute to people with obesity problems rather than looking for the silver bullet. Functional medicine redefines disease. It's the emergence of a new paradigm. There are maps and tools that I'll show you in terms of how this is different. There's also a new framework for how to interpret clinical information. Function versus pathology is, is a big part of how functional medicine got its name. So pathology means disease. What's the disease? What's happening under the microscope? And it's a little bit like that hedgehog concept that we talked about. It's this specific thing, whereas function says there's these different functions of the body that come together in a certain way. So one person's diabetes isn't another person's diabetes. They look the same, but the functions of the body that lead to it for one person are different than for another. Etiology versus geography refers to Geography is the organ system that's involved. This is a heart problem. This is a brain problem. Etiology says, where does this come from functionally? One person's headaches might be because their CoQ10 got depleted because they take a statin. And another person's headaches might be due to inflammation that's triggered in the gut. And another person's headaches might be because their stress hormones are all out of whack because their dog died. So. Etiology means where does this come from on a fundamental level? And then physiological systems versus diseases is a similar breakpoint in functional medicine. Diseases are these constellations of findings that are very, very useful, and functional medicine doesn't throw any of that out. Just like we talked about the fact that that, that toolkit that I use, that's my MD toolkit plus everything else, diseases are very illuminating. They tell us important things but these systems of the body that contribute, the assimilation gut system, the immunoinflammatory system, the communication systems in the body are contributors. They're sort of the mass of the iceberg beneath the tip. And when we know more about that, we're able to help people more. A continuum of optimal function to disease. Health is more than the absence of disease. It's a spectrum. So for us, to, for us to say to a patient, I couldn't find a disease, thus you're healthy, often isn't very satisfying to patients because many, they come to the doctor's office and they say, I don't feel well, I don't feel optimal, I'm tired in the morning, or my stomach is always hurting when I've got a big job project. And when the involved healthcare provider says, well, I can't find ulcerative colitis and I can't find a bowel obstruction and your imaging is normal and your labs look fine and your liver function tests are normal so you're not sick. A person has this logical question, well something's going on, I don't, I don't feel well. Functional medicine tends to work really well for those sorts of patients because it's able to instead look through a lens and say to this person, all right you're not here at disease but you're not optimal either. You're somewhere closer to the disease end of the spectrum. Let's look at the functions of the body that might not be optimal, shift those, and see what happens. And thankfully what happens is 
people tend to do a lot better. This is important because this is a Mayo Clinic publication about 10 years worth of research in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most respected medical journals in the world. And these gold standard studies, double-blind placebo-controlled trials, over that 10 years in New England Journal, 40% of the practices that were based on the best available evidence reversed. So what does that tell us? Again, it doesn't tell us that there's something bad about double-blind placebo-controlled trials because these are the gold standard. It does tell us that these complex systems biology type problems, complex chronic diseases, we, we're not sort of getting our hands around them in a way that shifts, shifts those folks for good. So an example would be women should take hormones because the hormones are good for their heart and then over the 10 years, oh, we know now that women taking hormones after menopause isn't necessarily good for their heart. Those kinds of changes in practice probably reflect this systems biology aspect to people's overall well-being, that there are many, many factors to women's overall health, their menopausal status, and the health of their heart. And when we try to drill down and just say they should or shouldn't take hormones, we end up with this, with this wavering back and forth. Also worth noting, in a functional medicine plan for the same type of patient, we would look at these functions of the body and sort of balance overall. Well, are there ways you can make your own hormones? Are there ways your body can handle the hormonal systems better? What are you trying to do for your heart that you were thinking about handling with hormones that maybe we could cover with food as medicine, exercise, stress management, etc.? Functional medicine also incorporates research into systems biology. So probably the best way to summarize this is these approaches we've been talking about with conventional medicine that, that break something down and look at a very specific solution, kind of treat the body like a machine. And systems biology says that the human body and the way it functions is kind of like an ecosystem in nature. So how do we analyze that? If the river is interacting with the bears and the bears are interacting with the plants and the plants are interacting with the river and all the time the insects are interacting with the soil, everything's interacting with everything else all the time. How do we analyze that? Systems biology, independent of functional medicine, is making progress on these kinds of analytical tools and the functional medicine community has been paying attention to systems biology for about 30 years and tying it into the tools that you'll see here shortly for how we figure out these kinds of problems. So functional medicine addresses the underlying causes of disease, uses a systems-oriented approach, and engages both the patient and the practitioner in a therapeutic partnership. It's worth noting here that every single functional medicine case is built for that person and it's based on a therapeutic alliance. This is what functional medicine reveals about you. So even though it can help tremendously, and my hope is that it will literally help millions of people, either during my lifetime or after, every single person's functional medicine case is built for them. And I think there's something really lovely about that. And I think there's a lot of integrity and honesty in that, that each person is different, thus their approach needs to be different. This is the functional medicine tree. It's a summary. You can see from signs and symptoms up are the things that a lot of folks are familiar with anyway. Organ system based diagnosis, cardiology, endocrinology, neurology, etc. And then the signs and symptoms that lead to an organ system diagnosis. You've got heart failure, you've got asthma, etc. Functional medicine uses that information but it adds to it information from the trunk down. What are the organizing systems of the body that we've been talking about, these areas of function, the gut, the communication systems, meaning the central nervous system, the hormonal systems, the immune system? What's happening in terms of immune and inflammatory systems in the body and whether they're over responding versus responding appropriately? What's the transport status in the body? What's the structural in integrity, whether that's at the back of the joints on kind of a macro level or down at a cellular level, like how cell membranes are supple versus stiff or whether the gut barrier has integrity. And then even below that, what are the antecedents, triggers, and mediators 
that flow upstream into those functions, meaning did this person have good food when they were a child? Did breastfeeding help colonize the gut? Was the person stressed? Were they exposed to heavy metals because they were next to a refinery? And then another level below that, what's the person's genetics? What kind of genetic hand did they get dealt? Can they turn folate into its active form or not? And then how do they turn those genes off and on? That's called epigenetics, which is influenced by our attitude, our exposures. And right at the very base, down at the roots, what are the things that, that are the sort of origin coming up in? Does the person get enough sleep? Do they have these sorts of exposures that could be problematic or do they get support from their food? Do they have so social support? What's their activity level? like how stressed and resilient are they? And the tree is meant to be a summary of everything that matters in functional medicine. I promised you at the beginning of the presentation a look at the tools that allow a different analysis. And this may be the most important one, the functional medicine matrix. There's a lot going on here. Off to the left you can see that functional medicine providers retell the patient's story back to them after collecting information. So antecedents are things that come before and looking at antecedents, again like whether or not the person's gut microbiome is colonized or not as a child, on and on, endless number of things that are really important in antecedents. Triggers could be stress or a good trigger like a change to a healthier food plan. Mediators and perpetuators might be the person's food plan itself or whether or not there are organisms in the gut that don't belong or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that are irritating the gut or, or perhaps putting some little holes in the gut barrier. Down at the bottom you can see what we call the modifiable lifestyle behavioral factors. How's that for a mouthful? Sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition, stress, relationships. These have an impact on the person and these are the things they can modify to, to be a point of leverage to get better or to be optimal. Mental, emotional and spiritual factors are right in the middle of the functions of the body. That's a recognition of how important those things are and also that those three areas of function integrate and connect the other seven areas that I've alluded to a little bit. Defense and repair is the immune and inflammatory system in the upper right. Those two systems function in concert. What comes up in my practice a lot is that 70% of the immune system is stationed next to the gut and the contents of the gut and the immune system are only separated by a barrier that's one cell thick. Also, People have inflammation affecting them that's silent. Lots of folks know they're inflamed, but all of the modern ills, cancer, dementia, heart attack and stroke have inflammatory components due to what we would call silent inflammation. So these connections of the immune and inflammatory system and how to quiet them down and get them functioning properly turn out to be a really big deal. We mentioned it a moment ago, assimilation up into the left, how the gut functions. Structural integrity, I talked a little bit about that. Could be macro issues like joints. Could be microscopic fundamental issues like cell membrane suppleness helped by omega-3 fatty acid or the gut barrier having better integrity because of improved quality and nutrient density of the food. Communication covers a lot of ground. It's the brain and nervous system. It's all of the hormonal systems of the body, adrenal, thyroid, sex hormones, and the immune system shows up there again in communication. Transports the heart, the blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels, and then biotransformation elimination, often it's referred to as detox, but I think biotransformation elimination is more helpful. It's the ability of the body via the liver and the early small bowel to break down and get rid of things or recycle them. And then energy, one of my favorite areas, it sounds self-explanatory, but in functional medicine, it's a specific reference to whether or not the power plants of the cells, the mitochondria, have adequate support or whether 
there are things that are, are hampering the mitochondria. And the reason I love this is that this is a great point of leverage and a really simple point of leverage in so many cases that I see. We see and treat a ton of fatigue. It is the number one diagnosis in my clinic. And these are folks coming in saying, I'm not depressed, I'm not anemic, I don't have cancer, and I'm out of gas, what's wrong? And the mitochondrial support we do is fundamental things like if you, if you eat nutrient-dense whole food, your mitochondria are happier because you're not ingesting things that sort of dampen the mitochondria. B vitamins and magnesium from food or safe professional grade supplements often just do spectacular things for people with energy issues via mitochondrial support, so a really interesting area. Transitioning again, these are the three legs of the stool, another tool that I promised to talk to you about. And the functional medicine community has said, we need to look at these modifiable lifestyle behavioral factors. We need to organize these clinical imbalances in a way that, that makes sense. So if somebody has silent inflammation that's affecting their heart and the inflammation is generated in the gut, we're gonna to need to start with the gut to get that person better. And that left leg of the stool is one of the most important things in forming that therapeutic alliance in that the person comes in, we'll use that same patient example, I'm tired but I don't have a disease, what's going on? So when I'm working with a patient like that and I collect the information via digital questionnaire, time spent with the person one-on-one, -on -one, looking through all their old medical records, I'll retell their story back to them after they've shared it with me and say, so here's what I'm hearing. You were doing really well until you were 20, and then you were divorced, and then the quality of your food dropped off, and then you lost your job, and you didn't exercise as much, and then you ended up in the hospital with pneumonia, and you took a lot of antibiotics, and now here's where you're at. You've got a lot of gut symptoms. You're tired, so we're gonna to need to look at your gut. Did your microbiome in the gut get knocked out by the antibiotics? Do we need to support that with probiotics or or probiotic-rich foods? Do we need to support your mitochondria? Do we need to look at the stress hormones that were activated by everything that you went through and how you can restore those on your own by, by creating an environment that your adrenal glands like rather than dislike so they're not kicking out too much cortisol? And that's a chance for the person to say, yes, this is what I was after, this makes a lot of sense to me, or no, you didn't hear me, this is what I meant, I'm, I'm worried about this or I don't connect to that, I'm, I'm not worried about my gut, I just wanna focus on such and such. And that retelling a person's story, it reformats it for the person, and it creates a chance for them to say, I really wanna find out if this doctor is capable of the kind of teamwork I think I need to, to have this ongoing dynamic, because it's really an ongoing brainstorming session in functional medicine. And that's, that's just so satisfying as a physician to, to see people light up and say, oh, I had a suspicion this was such and such. Gosh, I get to actually work on this and, and have it make me better. Or, oh, I'm gonna table that, I'm gonna work on this first and then come back to that. So that's where the three legs of the stool are helpful. In some ways, functional medicine boils down to two really simple principles. Does this person have something that needs to go? Is there a bacteria in the gut that's releasing lipopolysaccharide that's getting absorbed into the system that's noxious to the heart and brain or pro-inflammatory? Are they allergic or sensitive to something? Is there some stress that needs to go by the wayside? Maybe by making some hard decisions about prioritization also, does this person have unmet need? Do they need more sleep? Do they need more social support? Do they need more fresh air? Do they need more vitamin D? Do they need more green leafy vegetables? Do they need some time off? This is drilling a little deeper into things that functional medicine doctors think about and offer to patients as far as what they might need to be rid of. And this often includes clues in the person's history in terms of stress or 
food that you can see down there at the bottom. If the person's eating the standard American diet, no surprise, the acronym is SAD. That might be an area for them to improve and look at, at whole foods or foods with less additives. And just to connect the dots a bit, a lot of the additives in food are hard on the mitochondria that we've been talking about. Pesticide is hard on the mitochondria. So when people say, oh, I don't necessarily believe that organic food would help move me forward, often a functional medicine provider will say, well, those pesticides are hard on the power plants and you're telling me you're tired, so why don't you try eating more, more food that you know hasn't been exposed to those sorts of things. Up at the top of the list, you can see that there are there are things that are toxic to the system, not toxic like you would think about a, a poison that if the person has one uh, pint of hemlock, they, they just die from the toxin, but low grade toxins that cumulatively build up over time. We know now Alzheimer's disease, one of the known 36 contributors to it is these toxins that come from molds. And molds have been this moving target. Are they a problem or not? I mentioned lipopolysaccharide that comes from overgrowths of bacteria that aren't really helper bacteria in the gut, like the good bacteria. Lead and mercury come up a lot. People in China are breathing air that has these heavy metal contaminants in it from the things that are being refined there. And and they're not the only ones in the world that are getting ingestions via breathing or, or eating some of these things. There are fish that have high levels of these metals because they're top of the food chain predators where the metals build up. And then allergens isn't the way an allergist would necessarily describe it. Sometimes it is, this person's allergic to such and such but also just looking at what stirs up the immune system. If that gut barrier doesn't have good integrity, little things sneak through from the gut, they stir up the immune system, then that silent inflammation starts causing trouble. And so we'll ask the person to listen to their body. Do they seem to be sensitive to certain foods? We'll offer them allergy testing to see if they have classic allergy, and we'll also offer them tests just to show whether things are crossing the gut barrier and triggering other kinds of immune activation like immunoglobulin G in addition to immunoglobulin E. Functional medicine has this big focus on adding the good. So we talked a moment ago about things that can drag the system down. That's often really intimidating to people. It's intimidating to me. It's worrisome. So the good news is that adding the good, whether it's the social support, the sleep, the exercise, these are the, what IFM, Institute for Functional Medicine, refers to as the ingredients for optimal function. And it's those modifiable lifestyle behavioral factors, food as medicine, the healing power of food, the healing power of enough sleep, getting enough exercise, talking to friends and family about what's going on, reaching out to the person's spiritual community or their sources of support and, and bringing that cocktail together in a way that creates vitality. It's another distinguishing feature of functional medicine. It uses vitality as a clinical tool. That sounds really obvious in a way that that would always be part of a healing practice, but perhaps part of where conventional medicine has missed an opportunity is that disease focus. We need to match this medication or procedure to this disease. The disease focus then drifts away from how much vitality is present. And it turns out how much vitality is present is a really big deal. I see it all the time in my clinic. The more vitality that's there, the more the body can find its own way and manifest its own resources to deal with these problems that again, aren't necessarily even diseases, they're just suboptimal function that needs to be restored to normal. Institute for Functional Medicine put together the slides that you saw today. I appreciate the Institute for Functional Medicine in so many ways, making it possible for me to be certified. 
They use the term standing on the shoulders of giants, which is completely accurate. The people over 30 years that donated their lives and time and energy and passion to this approach, they probably missed dinners with their kids. They probably spent a lot of time on the road. They spent a lot of time looking at journal articles and, and figuring these things out. And food as medicine might be one of the most important messages. So their last slide kind of puts it in our court. All right, this is about you. What are you going to do to move the ball downfield for me as a functional medicine doctor? I apply it in my own life. I believe in practicing what I preach and, and walking my talk. And it even has broader applications. Are we going to look at the quality of food that's available to everyone for those of us that are fortunate enough or have enough financial resource to have a garden or be able to buy the, the best thing in the store that our body wants, we're really lucky. Institute for Functional Medicine is asking all of us, not only can we do this to help ourselves, but can we do it to help our communities and help the world? What would be optimal is not only for this to be available conceptually and via folks that practice this way, but for this to be profitable and wise and sustainable and widely recognized and encouraged. I really appreciate your time today. Again, this is Rob Downey, MD, Institute for Functional Medicine Certified Practitioner coming to you from Homer, Alaska.